I would like to warmly welcome you to our panel on No Fuel, No Fight, the future of warfighting energy requirements, a pivotal topic aligned to this year's theme, Accelerate and Innovate, actualizing the nation's need for dominant air and space forces. My name is Doug Rayberg. I'm the Air Force Association's Executive Vice President and honored to serve as your panel moderator. A recent Stratfor forecast indicates, quote, the White House's move to elevate climate change to a national security priority will enable policy making changes that belie the more complex long-term challenge of actually incorporating environmental impacts into strategic calculations. In the next four months, the military has been charged to evaluate the security implications of climate change that can be incorporated into risk analyses, strategy development, and planning guidance that will no doubt be considered in the next national defense strategy. Now, this is a certainly has daunting implication for today's globally committed air and space forces. Let's face it, the US military is one of the largest institutional consumers of fossil fuels and changes in the price and mix of energy options have a significant impact on the service's budget and operations. Even more perplexing is climate change already fostering geopolitical competition in places like the Arctic and in some areas contributing destabilizing effects and which could lead to unrest or conflict that affects U.S. interests abroad. As a result, deploying capability to and sustaining a fight from alternate locations around the globe have changed the energy calculus if air, space, and cyber forces are to fight and win against peer and near-peer threats from China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and more. Now, joining me to tackle these tough issues are three leaders in the Department of the Air Force and one leader representing the world's largest producer of wind and solar energy and largest capital investor in energy infrastructure in America. Please welcome my guest, Ms. Kristen Baldwin, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Science, Technology and Engineering, Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition, Technology and Logistics. Mr. Bert Guerrero, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Operational Energy, Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Installations, Environment, and Energy. Mr. Joseph McDade, Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff from Plans and Programs, Headquarters U.S. Air Force. And representing an indispensable strategic partner is Lieutenant General Tony Rock, U.S. Air Force retired, now a senior advisor for defense affairs for Next Era Energy. Ms. Baldwin, set the scene for us. From an acquisition perspective, really what are the energy technology investment opportunities that you see the Air Force is working to assure mission success in the battle space? Please. Thank you, General Rayberg. As you say, as civilian regulations for energy efficiency, emissions, and clean energy continue to advance, the Air Force and Space Force will need to reduce fuel consumption and decrease our emissions. Add to that the strategic importance of ensuring fuel availability to the warfighters, and you see why we're having this panel today. As the panel representative for Department of the Air Force and Space Force Science and, Techno and, and Technology and Engineering, I'll be pleased to share with you technology investments and activities we are making as we prepare for current and future energy challenges. What I see as our most pressing opportunity is to ensure promising technologies transition to the warfighter quickly. I believe that we can and should do this by redesigning how we emphasize and reward programs that make life cycle energy efficiency considerations a prerogative from the start. I believe we also need to design opportunities for adoption of technologies into our systems. 
So enable them to adapt and be modified as these technologies become available. So with regard to your question, I'd like to highlight some ongoing science and technology efforts at our Air Force Engine at our Air Force Research Laboratory. We have investments in four key areas related to this topic, advanced engine concepts, weight and power reduction, advanced or alternative fuels and batteries. And I'll just say a little bit about each area. Uh, related to advanced engines, AFRL is developing disruptive technology for next generation turbine engines in our advanced turbine technologies for affordable mission capability program. We have government and industry teams working together on advanced turbine-based propulsion power and thermal technologies for legacy, as well as in development and future military propulsion programs. Technology goals include reduced costs, increased fuel efficiency, and increased propulsive capability. Example capabilities that we're looking at right now include fully adaptive engines with variable turbines, high pressure ratio compressors, and ultra compact combustors for long range air superiority uh, and directed energy and electronic warfare. We also are investigating rotating detonation engines that will enable simple, lightweight, low cost, high speed missiles. We are investigating distributed propulsion driven by hybrid turboelectric cores that can help enable large sensor payloads and offer extreme endurance for autonomous systems. We, and finally, we also, in the engine category, we also have ultra low cost expendable attributable turbine engines that we're using in uh, more affordable drones and missiles technology. In terms of weight and power reductions, two areas that we're investing in. Uh, the first is electrification. In order to support efficiency, environmental and system performance, we've got research in turboelectric and hybrid electric technologies. Uh, we're looking at megawatt class facilities that can help enable uh, testing and development. This is pretty critical as we move forward to have the right infrastructure. And we're investigating how we can partner with commercial on uh, energy storage um, uh, components that they may, that they have that, that we can adapt into our platforms. And the second area in weight reduction, we're looking at materials. Uh, materials innovation technologies can provide significant structural weight savings and which leads to our uh, an opportunity for fuel efficiency improvement. We think we can hit uh, next gen mobility and tanker aircraft with an with a fuel efficiency improvement of between 25 to 65%, which is pretty impressive. I like to talk real quickly about advanced and alternative fuels. Our lab uh, fuels and energy branch is home to an internationally recognized team of experts here. And we have ongoing research in targeting fundamental chemistry that can help uh, enable Im improved fuel quality and military performance. We're also exploiting combustion properties to increase system performance. We're looking at hot fuel thermal management architectures and we're looking at uh, fuel technologies and formulations that can enable hypersonic flight. We're also looking at biotechnology and synthetic biology that can produce um, and enable advanced fuel development. And also the ways in which that this technology can combat adverse ex effects that microorganisms have on this type of alternative fuel technology quality and those properties. And then just finally, one last word on batteries. Batteries, is, as you know, that technology is needed for, for all domains, space, missile, air, and ground-based applications. We have a three-year project co-funded with industry that is looking to develop a high-rate battery with increased power, decreased weight and volume, and more timely recharging. Is based on Formula One battery technology. Uh, so we have a lot that we can gather here in the, in the Department of Defense from our commercial partners who have this same uh, challenge that we do. Thank you.
Let's uh, let's go a little higher uh, to the operational level. Uh, Mr. Guerrero, uh, I guess this is kind of a burning question uh, for many in our audience. In your analysis of how we plan and execute the mission with respect to operational energy, seriously, are we on track to compete with a peer competitor in the battle space of the future? Well, thank you, uh, General Rayberg, and I want to thank AFA for hosting this panel. Um, for us, you know, as an operator, when I uh, served out at uh, Kadena Air Base, flying over the Pacific or flying combat missions over Afghanistan, didn't really think much about fuel. You know, the fuel truck would pull up to me, uh, you know, fill up my aircraft. I didn't think about whether the fuel tanks at Kadena Air Base had enough fuel in them for me to, to conduct my missions. Uh, didn't think about the tanker behind uh, that I was behind. Uh, uh, whether I was going to be able to get fuel from that tank or whether they had enough to give uh, to me, you know, fuel logistics just magically happened. And, and in large, uh, by and large, in, in the locations that we were operating from, they, there are fuel logistics supply chains were free from threats. However, we know our peer competitors will be challenging these supply chains and other energy sources. And the places that we will be operating from will be more dispersed uh, than we have operated from in the past, especially in the Pacific. You've got island chains with long distances, a lot of water. So, um, you know, we'll need to be th thinking differently about how we use this critical uh, mission resource. And so my office looks at how we improve the way we plan and execute missions. That's, uh, you know, through various uh, flight planning and um, other types of tools that we could use. Um, we look at how we execute the mission. So um, uh, looking at efficiencies and ways we can do that better. Uh, we look at how we can improve the way we sustain and moder modernize legacy aircraft. That's everything from engine washes to uh, coatings and the shaping of compressor blades to make our engines more efficient, um, as well as drag reduction techniques that we know that commercial industry is using and that we want to adopt. And uh, really, those are all looking towards how these efforts can help us address the risks in future operations with respect to fuel logistics. Now, these improvements are gonna help us reduce operational costs and they will definitely lower our, our impact on climate change. But to be clear, you know, our office is looking at how we maximize combat capability, how we get more bang for the buck, how that uh, aircraft can fly that much longer, can stay on station that much longer, and uh, how we can deliver more munitions against our adversaries when we have to. So Mr. McDade, uh, you know, the Pentagon has acknowledged that climate change poses a threat to its mission capabilities. So from a uh, force provider perspective, how do you factor war fighting energy requirements into strategic plans and programs for the Air Force? Yeah, so General Reitberg, again, thank you for having me on this panel and thanks for the question. Again, energy is obviously one of the things that we balance as we develop our POM and, and uh, you know, balance competing priorities. But I must say that uh, when you listen to uh, Kristen's list of energy technologies that are in the pipeline, uh, I'm proud to say that your Air Force is investing in all of those technologies. When I hear Bert talk about uh, operational savings, um, I think he's being modest. And I don't know, Bert, if I could throw you back a question. Are you uh, comfortable sharing with the audience the uh, rate or the return on investment that, that you currently think some of your investments will give our Air Force? Bert, over to you. Yeah, so some, some, some basic, um, basic um, modifications. So let's say, for example, C-17 will result in about a one to 1.2% drag savings. That particular program is about a $3 million program to install these microvans on all aircraft throughout the fleet. So one time $3 million cost, about a $10 million savings per year. Um, so that type of return on investment exists throughout our fleet that we can get after, not only just in uh, drag reduction and uh, increasing the efficiency of our engines, but also in scheduling. We see big scheduling, um, improvements. If you look at Jigsaw, for example, which is a program that went from a whiteboard to electronic whiteboard out of LUD, that on, uh, is going to save on the order of 200,000 uh, gallons of fuel per week right now with the current system that they have. The automated planning capability will take it closer to 500 to, uh, um, yeah, 500 
thousand to a million gallons of fuel per week. Now that's a million gallons that we don't have to spend on fuel that we can spend on other items, or in case of wartime or when things heat up, that's another uh, million gallons that we can use per week to execute more mission. So those are the kind of things that we see that are uh, in the art of the possible within the next year. Yeah, so Jim Reitberg again, with, with rates of investment return like Bert is describing, with the excitement that Kirsten is describing, a multitude of technologies that we have in development, I think it's safe to say that your Air Force is investing heavily in energy technologies to improve war fighting. And uh, I think from the A8 perspective, we're, we're waiting for the defense planning guidance, which I think you alluded to. We expect to make very clear under this administration that we will prioritize investments in climate change and energy savings uh, to a degree to which we have not previously done. No, thank you. Uh, let's step to uh, General Rock because, you know, talk about climate change, you probably recognize that he's somewhere in Texas uh, in a vehicle uh, broadcasting uh, based on the cold we're experienced this month. So uh, General Rock, you're representing a Fortune 500 energy company that's also top 20 in the world for innovation at least according to the fortune. Uh, from their C-suite perspective, I'm sure they strongly believe in the power of collaboration with their defense customers. You know, how, can they, how can that be improved to assure they are part of helping drive an innovation ecosystem focused on expeditionary war fighting and definitely alternative energy needs? Well, thanks very much for having me this morning, Doug, as part of this uh, great panel and a great discussion. Hopefully it's the stimulus for follow on discussions at the executive level, all the way down to the action officers and the wing level. And to your point of a, an ecosystem of innovation, that's really important. You're exactly right. Next Era Energy is uniquely positioned as, in fact, a Fortune 200 company. Uh, last time I checked about number 187. $160 billion market capital company, which is larger than McDonald's or Royal Dutch Shell. And it's probably the biggest company you've never heard of. And you're right, it is the largest producer of wind and solar electricity, but also is a all domain source provider. By that, I mean gas fired turbines, nuclear power, as well as wind, solar, high capacity battery, and something that's very exciting for the probably near future, which is green hydrogen. And what we're seeing right now in Texas, where 35% of the electric customers are either out of power or have partial power with rolling blackouts. There's a question here, I think for the Air Force when it comes to mission assurance and through in infrastructure energy. And the Air Force recently published a a infrastructure energy strategic plan. And one of the things I noticed in it was by the end of fiscal 21, they plan to run five different bases through what they're calling an energy resilience readiness exercise where they disconnect the bases from the grid. And so I asked myself, uh, that's great, but are we involving industry partners in this either as participants in the exercise or as uh, observers who can then capture their understanding of Department of Defense and specifically Air Force requirements as customers and stakeholders, and then look at what products and what services they provide across the industry to say, we have a solution to your stated requirements and problems. None of us wanna bring a solution in search of a problem. So it starts with customer, un with understanding the customer's requirements. And that is a long preamble to answer your question of, one of the things that we can do right away is increase the interaction at the DOD executive level, all the way down through action officers between industry providers of solutions and Department of Defense requirements holders, those who can articulate what they want the Air Force to have and be. I think of uh, the discussion of weapon systems and the base as a weapon system. We've got to get away from the mentality that the base is just a place you take off and land and understand, as you say, no fuel, no fight. That's true at the operational level with Bert and his uh, team of merry men and women doing the right things for operational energy. But it's also true for infrastructure energy. So what are the solutions that industry can provide? And you're right in saying that Nextair Energy and other industry leaders have not just a willingness, but a great appetite 
to engage potential Department of Defense stakeholders, customers, users, partners, and may I use the word indispensable. Next Air Energy wants to be that indispensable partner for the Department of Defense and bring a lot of the innovation they have done at scope and scale as such a large company and such an industry leader to benefit the Department of Defense. Hopefully that answers your question. No, it absolutely does. In fact, uh, let me take that on an innovation line over to Ms. Baldwin. So how do you really seek new ideas for energy technology and innovation awareness? Because this is critical to the war fight. Ms. Baldwin. Thank you. Yes, it's uh, it's really critical to reach out to partners um, in industry and academia. We have a number of ways we do this. Um, one is, um, as I mentioned before, our Air Force Research Laboratory, our advanced power technology office there has kind of a standing open call for a broad agency announcement that that industry and um, startups can can uh, propose to so that's ongoing one of the one of the interesting things that we've done with our afworks organization is to make energy a topic um, a key topic last just last september afworks established an energy challenge and in september they kicked off a, a major event with over 300 people for four days to kind of huddle and figure out how can we reimagine ways in which we can tackle the energy challenge that we face and, and engage with industry and all the, all the good ideas. The group came up with research topics that are now open to large and small businesses. And they set a bunch of goals, a number of goals um, for the energy challenge. Um, to seek to uh, make progress against, including reduced demand on fossil fuels, uh, reduced reliance, um, leveraging of all energy sources, uh, wind, water, nuclear, hydrogen, uh, thermal. They're, they're seeking, we are seeking to create new industries and uh, uh, capabilities um, that can be supportive of uh, the Defense Department, but you know, across our nation. And how can we leverage energy from space? So a couple, couple very you know kind of challenging outcome goals. And just as a just as a uh, kind of a, an update on that, 900 responses were received to this call. <clears throat> 175 of those proposers are now competing for an initial tranche of funding that we have about five million dollars available. Um, and we anticipate awarding about 15 or so contracts uh, to those to this for this initial um, activity. Um, AFWorks has also got a number of what they call prime programs. Um, and we've made um, an energy prime effort uh, one of the options that we're looking into. We're looking at, at uh, into some market research right now to see how we can prime the energy market. And based on our market research, we're focusing here in the next year or so to explore two potential focus areas to partner with industry. One is an ultra efficient aircraft. And the second area of focus would be next generation aviation fuels. Another way that I wanted to describe to, to the audience is how we partner across the department and with our other federal agencies. Because um, there's a lot that we can uh, gain by leveraging and, and sharing information. Our Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering has a longstanding community of interest, uh, the energy and power technologies community of interest. And it's community of interest where we share our science and technology. Uh, we, we partner with our sister services and, uh, and agencies there. Um, they, that COI develops technical roadmaps that relate to energy challenges and also has identified um, jointly funded pro projects that we can all kind of partner with and, and make progress on. We engage as well an interagency advanced power group that brings together air-centric and space-centric organizations um, uh, for, for joint efforts, such as uh, new, new types of fuel cells for both of these, um, these communities. 
And uh, we have longstanding collaborations um, from a technology perspective with our sister agency, Department of Energy. Um, they are obviously a key player in this, in this topic. And we engage um, routinely with their ARPA-E, their Advanced Research Project Agency for Energy. They have a recurring technology showcase. And, we, uh, and in addition to that, we also work with the DOE labs on this topic, um, such as Argonne, Oak Ridge, uh, and Ames. And they, through that, we have key opportunities to team with them uh, in technology areas and offer and share kind of use of facilities. And lastly, I've talked a lot about industry and agencies. I want to point out that, you know, uh, inspiring and continuing our investments with academia is so crucial to the long-term, um, you know, co competitive advantage that we need to, we need to gain. And our Air Force Office of Scientific Research has had a number of grants that continue uh, to focus on on um, on ener energy efficiency, so that academia uh, element is is uh, front and center as well. Thank you, Mr. Guerrero. Uh, when it comes to sustainable alternate fuels uh, and other things, you know, what other optimization programs uh, would you personally like to see in the near term? So, in in the near term, uh, we really are interested in software. Um, so I talked a little bit about Jigsaw and um, the optimization program that's being put on top of Jigsaw, which turns a, let's say, 50 tanker schedule into a 48 tanker schedule, 47 tanker schedule, which means that those other tankers can go somewhere else to provide uh, support to combat operations. Uh, that auto planning feature, we think, is going to get us another 10 to 15 percent. Um, efficiency gain on top of that 4%. So when you start talking about on the order of, you know, 15 to 20% optimization of the mission, and that's just that one air operations center, that one air operations center will go from roughly about 200,000 gallons of fuel that's saved per week to about a million gallons of fuel that's saved per week. That's fuel that can be used elsewhere. It's, it's, um, and it really allows our operators to uh, execute the mission more effectively in that the planning can be, um, the planning time is reduced dramatically from a 12 hour plan to uh, a four hour plan when we went to this electronic whiteboard. It's really a whiteboard to electronic whiteboard. And, you know, all of us are dealing with those type of technologies now, Waze, Google Maps, uh, the auto planning feature for us uh, makes things very easy. The same thing can happen at our air operations center through this uh, auto planning feature where the, um, the operators and planners are getting suggestions on how to optimize not only for the next day's schedule, but the day of schedule. Um, uh, second piece that we're working on uh, with respect to optimization, and, and I, would, I have to say that Kessel Run and PEO Digital have done some great work in, in working that piece in getting those um, low cost, high payback software initiatives going. Um, uh, Air Mobility Command is working on something called Magellan that uh, we helped fund uh, with Pivotal Labs and uh, their Conjure AMC software factory. And the idea behind that is, is once we start looking at how do we um, in one theater do a better job of scheduling tankers to, re to receivers, how do we make sure that the allocation process of our tankers are, is well spread throughout the world so that um, uh, airplanes are in the right places to either conduct training or conduct combat operations um, uh, and that there's some uh, good sense of what the requirements are for the future few months in order to place those aircraft in the right places. And then finally, you know, as a squadron commander, uh, AWAC squadron had like 15 different crew positions for 20 some odd members uh, uh, per aircraft. And the whole scheduling process for air crew was really challenging. And then we would have several different what we called flights that would control our um, our scheduling of air crew would go in, look at currencies to make sure that folks were staying current or getting recurrent in those things that they had to do. And what we're seeing is that um, a, a software factory out of PACAF called Tron has been working on something called Puckboard. And that currently is in the C-17 community, but it's looking to expand. And the idea behind that is similar to what we talk about, about Jigsaw and, uh, and Magellan in that you're automating the way we schedule it. It reaches into our requirement system, comes back and says, these are the crews that need training tomorrow. 
And these are the instructors that can provide that training to that, those crews. So from a um, automation or automation of air crew scheduling, we think that is another area that we'd like to see advance here in the future and will result in making sure that the right crew are getting the right training at the right time and increasing readiness. That's great. Mr. McDade, you know, let's, let's take what we just heard from Ms. Baldwin and Mr. Guerrero and kind of put it back to plans and program. Uh, is your team planning for an alternate future where O plans and op plans account for forward operating locations, perhaps using a renewable to sustain the fight, like uh, green electricity from wind, solar, or perhaps green hydrogen? Yeah, so we're, I think we're working with the staff to take a look at a number of alternative futures. Great question. And, you know, really to hone in on the energy resilience piece of that, you know, I think Rock hit the nail on the head. The our bases are our projection or power projection platforms. And so I'm very interested, we're very interested in finding out what happens when we actually turn five bases off from the grid and how long can they operate and what do we learn from that? Because we think the lessons learned there are even more salient in forward operating positions. So, so let's, let's take that, what you just said, and turn it into more or less the collaboration with public and private partners. Uh, so General Rock, uh, you know, what can the air and space works learn from the next, next era, literally to accelerate these efforts to develop both garrison and forward bases of the future that frankly are going to have to be less carbon dependent? So General Mattis, and this is in, you know, I don't, I don't have to use Chatham House rules because this is in open source information. General Mattis was famous for saying, unleash me from the tether of fuel. Um, and he was talking, I think, about mobility, moving forward, but also bases, right? I mean, we saw in Iraq what happened as we went forward. And, and we know from a logistics point of view, when you outstrip your ability to supply your lines, then all of a sudden the advance comes to a grinding halt. So it's a great question. What, what can we learn from the scope and scale of large projects specific to renew renewables, wind, solar, high capacity battery storage, and in the very near future, green hydrogen production, which, oh, by the way, wind and fuel, uh, wind and, and solar, as it continues to expand, rather than curtail when you've got a lower demand for electricity, you can take that excess power back into green hydrogen production and distribution, right? So there's a cascading beneficial effect there. To your question of yeah, in garrison, and then also smaller footprint, uh, truly expeditionary bases returning to that mentality. Can we scale those large projects down? And what can we learn? If you don't have to take what I saw in Iraq uh, in 2011, and when I uh, was honored to, to lead the wing at uh, Sather Air Base, the air base of Baghdad International, we had huge generators the size of panel trucks they were brought in on pallets, but they took diesel fuel to run. And we had to do that because the Iraqi production and power grid was not dependable enough for us to have mission assurance. Okay, if we could scale those to have the right combination of fossil fuel, diesel generators, but also with wind and solar uh, production and high capacity battery storage and fuse those things together in an expeditionary manner, how powerful would that be to say, when I show up, I don't have to worry as much about diesel fuel being shipped in because I show up and the energy source is on site, the wind and the, and the sun, right? And so it's a shift in the mindset of how we would do expeditionary operations. Uh, let me talk a little bit about, uh, to your point of what can Department of Defense learn from what industry is doing or could do. I'm gonna give you two examples, one specific to the Department of Defense and that is Next Air Energy at industry cost, at their cost, is working with the Department of Defense, with the Department of the Air Force, to build a microgrid as Tyndall is rebuilt as the base of the future. And that microgrid would serve to power the first Air Force, America's homeland defense node, if you will, um, that if they lost their power from the grid, they would be able to, from wind, solar, and high capacity battery storage, have a number of hours of mission assurance. So how powerful would that be? Now, the next year energy is doing this as a pilot project because they'll gain from the knowledge of building that microgrid that they can then turn back to both commercial and governmental aspects and, and uses. The Department of Defense for a number of years will get this microgrid that provides mission assurance to the first Air Force and Homeland Defense is so important and we know that. Break, break, let me talk about another non a commercial 
effort on the part of industry and next era specifically and that is next era energy is entering an agreement uh, to work as a partner in the electrification of school buses yellow school buses around this country of which there are 550,000 that could be electrified they're also looking at public transportation buses of which there are 120,000 so in this partnership next era energy will learn from the battery power, battery recharge, recharge timing of recharging these vehicles. But the Department of Defense ground fleet, now we're getting into where it crosses into operational energy, but on the infrastructure, uh, Department of Defense, it, we know we, there's a mandate from the administration to lower the carbon footprint, to move towards hopefully a zero carbon foot, footprint. But what could the Department of Defense learn from what Next Era Energy is doing with these 550,000 school buses, 120,000 public transit buses for electrification? There, these are just two examples of opportunities for the Department of Defense to use what I call OPM, other people's money, right? And to take advantage of research and development that is ongoing, but has direct applicability to the Department of Defense. And you use the word collaboration, and I'll, I'll break after this but I am all about the C's. Uh, communication, cooperation, collaboration, coordination, compromise, reaching consensus. And those, those are the things that I think are, really will be powerful as industry intersects with the Department of Defense requirements. But up front, it's about that communication and conversation from industry's point of view to better understand the customer's needs and requirements and the resources they have available to put against the innovation. Hopefully that answers your question. No, it does. In fact, let me just expand on that now. Uh, we've got less than 10 minutes, but uh, I want to go to Ms. Baldwin. Let, let's shift from opportunities to vulnerabilities. And this is a very important part of our conversation. So Ms. Baldwin, uh, you know, given the fragility of the internet of things, uh, how do you secure the cyber, cyber vulnerable aspects of energy logistics. I think it's an important topic and I and as as uh, as General Rock was speaking I was thinking about how as we make these modifications and these these opportunities to uh, re to refit our bases as we do that, we should think about designing in resiliency, um, you know, as another attribute. So one of the things that I've been a part of over the last number of years has been a looking at cybersecurity, cyber vulnerability of our bases. Um, and uh, there have been a number of activities across the department to do cyber mission assessments. And it's, and it's not just about our systems, our weapon systems, but about these, these um, the, the assessments have to look into the logistics and base operations. Um, and, and, and for sure, the, um, that the, the supply chain and operations that provide fuel and power to, the, to our forces. There are standards that have been that have been um, published, you know, secure control systems, um, but it really comes down to, you know, putting the um, responsibility on the base commander and the and the base operations activities to understand to 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 help make sure that they have the knowledge and understanding of the standards and the and the and the weaknesses and fragility and but but make sure that they're they're factoring that risk in as greatly as they factor in uh, readiness risks. We are also, um, you know, I mentioned just really quickly supply chain. Um, as we move forward, um, supply chains for our acquisition systems and the supply chains for our logistics uh, will continue to have um, significant priority. And this is also an opportunity that we can work on with industry because our industry partners they that have their own supply chains that they rely upon, they share a common need to make sure that we are addressing cyber risk and cyber vulnerabilities in those supply chains. So that's another thing that we want to emphasize with our industry partners. Um, we collectively need to make sure that we're monitoring uh, cyber risks to our, to our supply chains. And so briefly, Mr. McDade, uh, do you guys factor in the cyber aspect as well in your planning? Absolutely. Actually, uh, as we go forward and building, uh, not well, redoing part of the FY22 uh, uh, budget estimate submission and the FY23 POM, 
Critical infrastructure defense will be a major priority as will uh, dealing with logistics under attack. And in both of those categories, uh, cyber vulnerabilities will be something we're going to take a very uh, close look at. So Mr. Guerrero, briefly as well. Okay, so what are the plans to war game or maybe not battle lab the, uh, the logistics of energy under attack? So um, when I took this job in 2014, my initial uh, discussion with um, some of the planners within the building was along the lines of what are the impacts of let's say fifth gen fighter engine upgrades and how that um, how that affect uh, operational plans, let's say in the Pacific. And, and what I found uh, pretty quickly was that we were really concentrating on other logistic factors, logistics factors, ammunition, for example, uh, uh, and, and that we weren't really looking at energy the way we thought we needed to look at it. So we um, hired somebody to help us engage with the wargaming community to take a better look at how we were wargaming out fuel logistics. First initially to observe and then from observing going to uh, Global Engagement 18 was really the first big one recently that we played realistic fuel logistics within the Air Force to make sure we understood what the impacts were, how many mission cancellations were from fuel logistics because of attack and other things as opposed to um, other causes. And it was not insignificant. And from there, we uh, progressed on to uh, working on the joint energy war games. We just did one in 2020. And that joint energy war game was um, looking at how, like, for example, again, in the Pacific, we rely on the Navy for certain things. The Navy relies on us for certain things to conduct that war. It's a joint fight. And uh, we want to get a better understanding of, of what the requirements are, what the realistic shortfalls could be between us and the Navy and how that's going to impact us. So, so we're already doing it and we uh, continue to be able to expand that capability because we think it's important for us to decide where we're going to base our aircraft and what kind of technologies we're going to go after. We really have to understand the risks that are out there and how we're going to buy things and move to places where the risks are reduced. Great touch. We got about uh, three minutes remaining. So in reverse order, let me just fire away here. General Rock, what final thought do you want to leave the audience? So uh, the final thought is this. Look, this is not binary. This is not oil and gas or renewables. This is oil and gas and renewables, at least for the foreseeable future. That's the power we're seeing right now in Texas. We've got to have more options. From a, a national strategy point of view, we know that more energy options are going to open more policy options. And we know that a good security and defense strategy is tied directly with an effective national energy policy and strategy. Communications and uh, conversations early and often between industry and, and the Department of Defense are absolutely critical. Next Air Energy is committed to their customer relations, and that's proven through their success. It didn't happen by accident. With Next Air Energy resources, the, the reason that they have been so successful is because they're able to build projects, get them online, and do it in an effective manner. On the utilities, the innovations that uh, big companies like Florida Power and Light under Next Air Energy have made have resulted in lower cost to customers, more reliant systems, and cleaner uh, energy that's produced and distributed. Eric Salaji, who you've met before, the CEO of Florida Power and Light, he sums it up best when he says, Next Era Energy and Florida Power and Light, yeah, we're not really an energy company. We're a technology and innovation company that happens to deliver energy. And we're committed to being that indispensable partner for the Department of Defense, and in this case, specifically the U U.S. Air Force. Thanks for the opportunity today. Thank you. Mr. McDade, your final thought, please. So again, for, for those listening in, I think it's an exciting time for this space. Uh, clearly, the administration is going to ask us to put more investment into this uh, ecosystem, and we're looking forward to supporting those uh, priorities and those, uh, those decisions. Thank you. Mr. Guerrero, last shot. Yeah, I would say that uh, I'm 100% sure we don't have it 100% right, and we need airmen to come forward with us. To, they see wasteful practices. They see things that we could do smarter and better. And, uh, you know, we have a website. With, there's the Airmen uh, Powered by Innovation website as well. We welcome your inputs to us because the only way we're going to get better is by looking internally, seeing those things that we can do better, and then getting after it. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Baldwin, final word, please. Bottom line, our acquisition system has many opportunities to make 
uh, energy efficiency uh, a factor uh, and priority for life cycle benefit. Our engineers and our suppliers can be incentivized to view energy efficiency as a technical performance attribute, just like we think about safety. Our acquisition program managers can incorporate energy opportunities into their basic risk and opportunity management practices. And as leaders, we can all reinforce energy efficiency as a mission goal, as you've heard from my co-panelists here today, that benefits warfighter readiness, life cycle cost, and the positive second order and third order benefits benefits on the environment. Wow. To my fellow panelists, uh, you know, excellent capstone to what we hope is an ongoing dialogue about alternative energy capability and the elevation of climate change literally to a national security priority. And uh, I think we've seen a little bit in uh, General Rock there and how climate change will affect operational planning. So thank you for joining uh, me here at AFA's Virtual Aerospace Warfare Symposium. And thank you to all those who tuned in to watch this panel on No Fuel, No Fight, the Future of Warfighting Energy Requirements. Now, please be sure to check out AFA's commitment to our guardians, airmen, and their families through our COVID-19 Airmen's Assistant Fund. AFA is proud to have awarded over $43,000 in direct assistance to families financially impacted by the pandemic. Please visit afa.org today to learn more and how to donate. And while you're at it, join the fight with us as a member of the Air Force Association. Thank you.